sixth chapter, in verses 9 through 10, which Cedric read into your hearing. And I'll read it again, and you can remain seated. I'll read it again, um, but we're going to build up to, to getting into how we even got here. So the scripture says, let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time, we will reap if we do not get weary. So then while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are in the household of faith. It's hard out there in these streets, man. It's tough. We get up here in this church and we look good, pretty pink, pink Sunday, and we put on our church smiles. And, but it's hard out there in these streets. It's hard at work. It's hard dealing with our kids. It's hard dealing with our spouses. It's hard dealing with ourselves. It's, it's tough out there in these streets, man. So when I get in the church house, man, I don't think it should be as tough. I, I should be getting some type of relief. But it's, the reality is, is that after I leave the church house, I go back out to these streets, and it's, it's hard out here on these streets. Real life meets me in the streets, and, and life meets me in the streets. So when I get caught up in, in, in the streets, and I get caught up in things, and my life overwhelms me and takes me down, I need my brothers and sisters to not get weary in well-doing. And I get tired of my mess. Anybody else in here got some mess that they going through? Not just somebody else's mess they putting on you. Your own mess. Your own mental health issues. Your own addictions. Your own pride. Your own me, myself, and I. Anybody else in here broken like me? Well, the way we got to this part in the text, and we're going to talk about serving all and serving one another is, you know, before we got to chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, there are a few more chapters before that and a few more things that lead up into this. In chapters 1 and 2, um, Paul is making a defense of his apostleship because in Galatia, um, the, the, they, had, they had been um, deceived. Some people came in there, and Paul had taught them one thing, and they came and told them that they need to work in order to um, really, truly be saved. That they need to work uh, all their salvation out, and that they need to be circumcised, and they need to do certain things culturally in order to really be saved. And so Paul, uh, first he has to let them know that my word is stronger than anybody else's word who has come and seemed like they've been sent. My word comes directly from God who made me an apostle. No man made me an apostle. So he spends the first two chapters dealing with that. Then he goes to chapter 3 and chapters 4. And then he th lays down some doctrine on them as it, as it pertains to their freedom in Christ Jesus. That they're no longer under the law, but they are under Christ Jesus. They don't have to get circumcised. They don't have to fast 100 days out of the week. I know that. That's impossible, right? But that's what people were telling them to do. Do the impossible things. That's going to make you more spiritual. Go to church. If you're always in church, that makes you spiritual. That's law. Just, that's what you're supposed to do. Don't break the law. But Jesus didn't come to tell you that you had to come to church. He came to show you that you were the church. And so chapters 3 and chapters 4, um, he's laying down this idea of you are free in Christ Jesus. You don't have to be bound up to those things. And then he gets to chapter 5 and chapter 6 and say, we got to work this thing out. we got to walk this thing out. One thing that he lays in the foundation of five and, and chapter 5 is that we're in a spiritual warfare. I know oftentimes we like spiritual warfare. The devil is out there. And, you know, there's principalities and powers of evil. And that's in Ephesians 6, right? So we like, man, the devil on my head. But what he talks about is this spiritual warfare that is going on inside of yourself. The flesh and the spirit are at war one with another. He said they hate each other. They're in opposition. Man, but I'm 100% flesh, and I'm 100% being baptized in the body. I'm 100% I'm spirit. So I have this duality going on in me. I, I have, um, I'm a spiritually, uh, this, this bipolarism going on in me because I'm absolutely 100% flesh, but I'm absolutely 100% spirit. Now, what wins? How does the flesh win or how does the spirit win? Well, the flesh wins when I feed the flesh. And the spirit wins when I feed the spirit. But how do I feed the spirit? You know, a lot of us like to binge watch, you know, shows that come on. And 
we be on Facebook, you know, talking about this show and promoting this show. And, you know, some of these shows, I'd be like, y'all wild. I ain't, you know what I'm saying? I ain't, you know, I tried to watch Power once. I couldn't do it. I'll be like swearing by it, you know, all these different things. I'm like, man, they spend, you know, they watch it. They, they know the characters and all that kind of stuff. And I ain't mad at it. That's just not me. I'm, you know, I don't, I don't want ghosts to come, the spirit of ghosts to come up in me because I might have some things in my past that it might affect me to where I might think I'm somebody that I'm actually not because I'm totally walking in the spirit. Anyways, a lot of times, you know, that's about an hour, 45 minutes you watch that show. And then it's like, man, I got to watch another show and I got to watch another show. And man, the Lakers are playing. I got to watch the Lakers and the Raiders are playing on this day. Oh my goodness. But I'm, I'm, I'm feeding my desires in my flesh. Not saying that it's sin. But I'm feeding my flesh. How much time am I spending feeding my spirit the word of God? So when trials come and life comes and we walk out these doors and real life happens, I'm either going to fight with the flesh or I'm going to fight with the word or the spirit. And if I don't have any word in me other than what's been preached for 35, 45 minutes on a Sunday, it's going to be tough to navigate through these streets because these streets are tough, y'all. And so um, he, he, he tells them, you know, the spirit and the flesh, they are at war. And, and so, man, I'm glad, I'm glad, you know, I'm not the only one where Paul talks in Romans 7, I believe it is, where he says he has this thing going on in him where, you know, the very thing he wants to do, he doesn't do. And the thing that he doesn't want to do, he does. And da, 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 da. Oh, but praise be to God. There's now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So we're going to have that fight. For the rest of our lives, we're going to be in the flesh, and for the rest of our lives, we're going to be walking in the spirit. And so we're going to always have that fight, but we're going to praise be to God that if I slip up, if I trip up, that that does not give me a heaven or a hell to go to. That is not in me. That is in Christ Jesus. So there is now no condemnation in Christ Jesus. So I'm not going to get caught up in my sin issues, not because they, they, they don't matter. I don't get caught up in my sin issues because sin issues will have you stuck, and next thing you know, now you know you're falling down this well and, and you can't get out because you're so focused on the sin issues that you forget that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. The flesh and the spirit. And so after they go, he, he talks about the flesh a little bit. And I'm going to read um, what he says about the flesh because the works of the flesh are evident. They're evident. They're, and, and it's two words that just popped into my head. There's works of the flesh and there's the fruit of the spirit. The, fir the, the first one is the works of the flesh. And that's in the, uh, Galatians 5, and starting at verse 19. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, Envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do or practice such things, make this their habit, their lifestyle, such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those are the works of the flesh. And that one, one that's popped up for me is that, that anger, those fits of anger. I don't know in here, I mean, anybody in here who got fits of anger, but, you know, somebody cuts you off on the freeway, you know, do you, do you have, you give them a, a middle finger or do you say the words? <laughs> do you chase them down and follow behind them and ride their bumper? <laughs> do you, well, you, you know, you, <laughs> Darren, sit down, man, because you popped into my head. Darren, I need you to sit down, brother. <laughs> I need you to, well, Jesus, bring that on in. <laughs> I'm going to bring that on in. Oh, Jesus. Fits of anger. <laughs> A product of the flesh. But the, the fruit, I'm going to move on because <laughs> the fruit of the spirit. <laughs> The fruit is a singular, the fruit is not fruits of the spirit. It's the fruit of the spirit, which is the spirit of God, which dwells in each and every believer. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. 
Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh which is pa- with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep and step. Let us walk with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another or envying one another. Right? So that's chapter 5. Right? So in chapter 6, verse 1, he talks about um, if a brother's, if anybody's caught in a transgression. Yeah. You who are spiritual. Who are the spiritual? The ones who walk in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are the spiritual people. (laughs) We love to check people and hold people accountable. We love to do it. We love to make sure we let them know when they're doing wrong. But my question to us, we're going to get to our passage, but we can't get there without dealing with this. My question to us is, are we spiritual? Do I live in the fruits of the Spirit? Is that who I am? Because, you know, the, 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 part, the part of me that wants to check people or hold people accountable, it's a nice Christian word, the part of me that wants to look out for people, the part of me really comes from my flesh. It really comes from my pride. I need to tell, they know better. I need to tell them something. I need to, you know, or, you know they making us look bad. They making the church look bad. They making, you know, they making me look bad. But... If the Bible tells me that those who are spiritual, those who operate in the fruits of the spirit, are to restore the one who has transgressed in a spirit of gentleness, this part, keep watch over yourselves lest you too be tempted, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So now my brother then got caught up and my sister then got caught up and and I'm spiritual so I'm going to restore him, but I have to guard myself so that I don't get tempted So if God is telling the spiritual people to watch for themselves, how much more so should us non-spiritual people have to watch for ourselves before the devil then takes us out and have us operating in our pride, have us operating in unforgiveness, have us operating in the things of the flesh? How, you know, that just jumped out at me and I was like, man, a lot of people, well, I'm not going to say a lot of people, I'm going to say me. In my, uh, not spiritual self. I'm oftentimes trying to make sure that everybody's okay. Then I wonder, how did I get caught up? How am I now walking in pride and unforgiveness? How am I now being judgmental on this brother or this sister situation as opposed to restoring them with kindness and gentleness? Why? Because I wasn't ready. This is just a little tidbit for some of y'all who be out there trying to act like you're more spiritual than you're not. When you get up in people's stuff and you're not doing it from a pure place, from a spiritual place, don't be surprised when all hell breaks loose in your life because the devil is not playing. This is a spiritual warfare. He's patient, and all he wants you to do is make you think, think you're doing something and helping somebody else, else out because you want to, you know, no disrespect to us putting things on Instagram and Facebook, you know what I'm saying, you know, but you want to, oh, you know, I helped this brother out, and, you know, I went and served here, and I, I went because you want the accolades. You want the accolades. I want to be the one who saved such and such. Jesus already saved him. What he wants you to do is restore them. But be careful, even you who are spiritual, even you who are spiritual, be careful unless you get caught up. So that's 6 verse 1, right? So, you know, why are you saying all this, Alvin? Because I can't deal with verse 10 and 9 and 10 if I don't deal with the fact that the context in this is talking about one another, about restoration. It's talking about us having each other's back. And if I'm going to serve you, then I got to serve you from a context. I have to serve you from the spirit. I can't serve you from the flesh because the the flesh is going to get tired. And and if I serve you from the flesh, then my flesh might pop off at you. You know what I'm saying? Once 
you don't do what I want you to do and you don't jump through the hoops that I want you to jump, then I'm going to cut you off. Now I'm in sin because God never told me to cut anybody off, but but he taught me to be patient and and to persevere and to have long-suffering because love is long-suffering and kind, but my long-suffering only lasts for two weeks, and and if you don't come back to me in two weeks or you don't come back to the church in two weeks or if you don't do what you're supposed to do in in two months, then if you don't do what you're supposed to do in two years, then then I give up on you. If you don't do what you're supposed to do in 20 years, but my God does not give up on anybody. And so those of us who are spiritual... As we're helping to restore people to their rightful place in the kingdom, we're going to be mindful. We drop down in chapter 6. We're going to go to verse 7. Verse 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. The one, for the one who sows into his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Sowing and reaping. So if I'm sowing into my flesh, I'm going to reap from my flesh. You don't sow watermelon seeds and get oranges. Right? You sow what you reap, period and point blank. You sow discord, you're going to reap discord. If you sow divisiveness, devise, uh, divisiveness, then you're going to reap it. If you sow an evil thought, or evil, you're going to reap what you sow. Not only are you going to reap what you sow, you're going to reap more than what you sow. So be ye careful. What you sowing? But sowing where? Sowing into other people's lives. Going back to that first chapter, first verse. Restoration. Be careful what you're sowing into people's lives because what you sow, you're going to reap. Right? So, I'm used, uh, it's nothing safe. So, uh, let me see. <laughs> oh, I don't care about being safe. I'm going to talk about marriage. If you sow discord into other people's marriages because you like one person more than you like the other person, instead of trying to get them together, and pull them together in unity and pull them together because, you know, God loves marriage and the devil hates marriage. Instead of trying to pull them together and now you're sowing discord, you over here saying, yeah, you should, girl, I feel you. You should leave, yeah. He didn't did this, yeah. Pull him, yeah, man, he's evil, yeah. Oh, yeah, yo, she got a mouth on her, yeah, but I feel you. I would have did the same thing. Don't be surprised when five years later, I pray it's not, it could be five minutes, but the devil is crafty. Because you sow, you know, when you sow, you don't reap immediately. So be careful what you're sowing into people's lives. So if I'm sowing my own feelings and my own thoughts about a situation, I got to be careful. I should be sowing the, the, the word of God because the word of God is the seed Right? And if I'm sowing the word of God, then the word of God is going to do what the word of God said it's going to do. And so when Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 7, do not judge, but to first take the log out of your own eye, and then you can help your brother with the splinter in his his eyes. He said, do not judge based off of who you are, based off how you feel. But the judgment is already in the word of God. So what does the word of God have to say about a matter? Goes back to the fact that what am I sowing into my spirit so that when I give out this advice that I'm giving... Am I making sure I'm turning people back to that which is able to free and cut both soul and spirit? The word of God. So, he says, I'm going to go back to the scriptures, finish this thing out. With verse, uh, verse 8, for the one who sows into his flesh, going to reap from where? The flesh, corruption. 
It's just going to happen. But the one who sows in the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. This is eternity. It's not just a moment in time. It's for all time, beyond life, right? And then this is our, our two verses. And let us not grow weary in doing good. Why? Because it's hard out there in these streets, man. And people are crazy. I ain't talking about just people out in the streets. I'm talking about church folk. Church folk got issues. And we like to say it's the hospital, right? But as soon as people and the patients in the hospital get a little sick, we start to, we're going to throw them out on the streets. It's supposed to be an emergency room and they can't even get any treatment, can't get any medication. Your insurance doesn't work here. But I can't get weary in well-doing. Well, what is these, this word well-doing? What does that mean? And it was very interesting when I was looking it up. The word well-doing um, is, is like beautiful construction. That's beautiful. You're, don't get weary in beautifully constructing. Don't get tired. Don't faint. Don't lose hope. Don't lose heart in beautifully constructing somebody else. Not your own self. Because servanthood and sacrifice is about somebody else. It's about giving of yourself for somebody else's sake. Because that's what Jesus did. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave, he gave, he gave. And so as servants, as, as men and women of God, don't get weary because people are going to get on your nerves. People going to be people. People ain't going to get ready when you want them to get ready. Because when you make it about yourself, when you make if brother or sister or sister such and such does whatever they do based off of you and, and your timing, and, and when you want it to happen, how you want it to happen, you're going to always be disappointed because it's not about you. It's about God. And you don't know if God is doing something in their life or God is doing something in even your life because you're too busy saying, they know better. They know better. They know, they know better. Faith, they know better. I'm tired, I'm tired of, ooh, I almost said something. I'm tired of that, brother. <laughs> he know better. I'm done with him. Because he know better. How many things that we've known better, yeah, we did them anyway. They know better. But the wisdom of Paul says, I know it's going to be tiresome. I know you're going to want to give up. I know that they're acting like an idiot. But don't you remember when you acted like an idiot? Do you not know that you are the hands and the feet of your Savior? So you're the spiritual one. Remember, this is the spiritual people he's talking to. Don't give up. Because in due time, not in your time, in the proper time, a time that God has appointed, God's appointed time, again, we have to be careful that we don't place limitations in our expectations on people because of our timing. We don't know what the sovereign God is doing and why he's doing it. But we, what he did tell me to do is don't give up. Don't be weary in my well-doing. Keep praying. Keep praying. Keep giving hope. Keep giving love. Keep giving forgiveness. Are, are you talking about enabling? No, I am not talking about being a man and woman of God. If you have the faith to remove mountains, but do not have love, if you give your body to be burned or to be given as a living sacrifice and and, and you don't have love, then it's it's nothing. Love is long-suffering and and kind. It's compassionate. It it sees the the pain that the other person may not even see in themselves. And I'm going to long-suffer with you for your own sake. And yes, it hurts me. And yes, I'm frustrated. Yes, I'm human. And yes, I'm all those things. But greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So I need to start pulling on my spiritual things. I got to look at it and see, am I praying enough? Am I praying about the situation or praying on the situation? 
Am I fasting, really fasting enough about somebody else's situation? When it's my own situation, I might go three straight days like, oh, Lord. Uh, but can you pray and fast for somebody else? When in reality, you don't see any benefit that you get out of it. Them going back to their husband or wife don't give me no benefit. I ain't going to get no money. They ain't going to cook me no dinner. They ain't gonna do nothing. It's all about them. But when I make it about me, what I'm going to get out of it? That I'm missing out on God's kingdom purpose. Jesus was already Lord and Savior and King in heaven. And he put on flesh for me and you. He sacrificed his life. He got off his throne. He got off his high horse so that you and I might be able to have a better life, a life that is an abundant life, a life that's outside of the confines of even earth. He wants to give us a heavenly life. And he stepped out so to you and I. He didn't need to do it for himself. He did it for us. And when it comes our time to do it, we... My little three-month limit is up. I tried for three months, God. You know me. You know how I am. And you know how you made me. And do not grow weary. Not You've been doing it. So it, it's not saying that you haven't been working. You haven't been looking out for other people. It says, do not grow weary um, in well-doing for in due season... We, we, we will reap a benefit or reward if we don't give up on the other person. Notice I said earlier, it's like, I don't get the benefits. I don't get no money. I don't get food. But when you kingdom minded, when you see the economy of we, that if I can restore this brother who's a mighty man of God, but he's fallen on some times, and if I can restore him, then he has something to offer to the body of Christ, and, and it's, it's we. It's not just something that, that benefits Alvin. It's something that benefits the body. So when I help one person get restored in the faith, then he's able to or she's able to do things for the entire kingdom, and it was never about me. It was always about we. Us, we shall reap a benefit if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good. That's intrinsically good. That's God's goodness. Let's do good to everyone because God allowed the, the sun to rise on the just and the unjust, and especially to those of the household of faith. <clears throat> Talking about servanthood. We can do all of the, the pretty servanthood stuff the next 21 days. And I 100% think we should. We can come and serve in a church week in and week out. And I think 100% absolutely we should. But this is not talking about any of that. It's not talking about a one-shot thing. It's talking about when your brother has 11 years sobriety. And the devil takes him down. Are you going to walk with him in his struggles? We use him up when he was in his sobriety. Oh, come do this, do this, do that. Use him up but when he needs us. Not just on Sunday. Monday through Saturday. If we need to go on them streets and go find them, are we going on the streets to go find them? Are we willing to sit in the home with a person who's in their binge on, of their addiction and, and, and they, they're out of it, but we're just sitting there? Or, or do we just, I'm going to text him. I'm going to call him. He didn't respond. Oh, well. That's not this. That doesn't make me weary. Somebody don't respond to my text, man. We so, I don't know what's wrong with us nowadays. Somebody don't respond to my text now. I don't, I'm going to cut them off. Yo, who are you? Marcus don't respond to nobody's text. <laughs> JR, on the other hand, always, maybe be 4 o'clock in the morning. JR, we be like, don't you go to sleep? He said, don't you go to sleep? 
But I'm glad we have technology and we're able to text and able to communicate through that way. But sometimes we need to sit down with some people in the gutter. Sometimes in order to really look like the church, we got to get dirty. So when it's talking about serving, you know, everyone, it's not just talking about people in the faith. It's talking about everyone. Because God allows the sun to go down on the just and the unjust. The rain comes down on the just and the unjust. Good and bad happens to every man. God cares about everyone. So when we have the opportunity, we need to make sure that we do kind things, that we're kind. If we're at work and that person who gets on our nerves is, and them clients and them, all them people, you do good to all of them. But especially, especially those who are in the faith, especially some of us treat people in the world better than we treat people in the church because they should know better. Oh, she, she didn't say nothing to me when she walked past me. Six years later, why are you mad at her? Because back in 1922... But your boss, a little late with your check, you still going to show up to work. You still going to be nice. You still, you're going to say something. You're going to under your breath. But you're going to be back at work that very next day. I got to show them Jesus. I got to show them the Lord. Don't you know that I need to see Jesus in you too? My, um, and I'm done, my biggest uh, right now fear my own personal life is if I were to ever just lose it, meaning, man, church, y'all, y'all can keep that, y'all. And you know, me just walking out I'm like, Sabrina, y'all can have her, y'all can, and I just I get caught up. For whatever reason, for whatever it is, the issue is, I get caught up. My biggest fear is not getting caught up. My biggest fear is y'all not coming to get me? Will anybody come get me? Oh, he done cheated on Sabrina. Will you come get me? <laughs> YouTube world, this is an ungodly church. I don't know what's wrong with these people. And I just want to, I want to point something out. It was the light-skinned people who was ready to fight me. Her and her and her, all the light-skinned people. I, not, not Brooke. I just did Brooke, did you do it too? She did too? Both of them? Oh, come on, man. You know what I'm saying? The light-skinned people was like, I don't know about that one, brother. You should have used another example. Man, yeah. My, oh, my dude, I already know. You dark skin, no, we got some melanin. They jealous. Anyways, let me use, a, let me use another, let me use another example. And it was all women, too, who was like, yeah, the brother's like, yeah, show you right. Yeah, and we got problems, but we do. If I get stuck out there doing something I don't have any business doing, Will you guys say he knew better and let me just go on out there and wild out? And, or are you going to come, come get me? Texting me is not enough. Calling me is not enough. You might have to come on Figueroa and come get me. No, nah, you don't need to come get me on Figueroa. You need to stay away from Figueroa. <laughs> He was the first one to say, I'll come get you right there. I, I got you. I'll be there. I'll be there every day with you, brother, if you need me to be. But will you come get me in my addiction, in my pain, when I'm not dressed all up, when I'm cussing like a sailor and smoking like a chimney, when I haven't bathed in weeks? See, y'all like the, the funny Alvin, the... There's an album that's all dressed up, the album of the sea walk every now and again. Y'all like that, dude. 
But there's the other side of me that if I get lost, y'all might not like. But I don't care if you don't like it. You don't have to like it. But do you love me enough to come get me? That's how we serve one another. Yeah, we're going to do these great things over the next 21 days and, and going forward. We're going to, you know, lay down some foundation of the things that we're going to do in, in the community. That's beautiful. That's great. We're supposed to do things for all men. But we have relationship one with another. What you go through, it affects me. Your pain is my pain. My sleepless nights because of what you're going through, that's real, man. Me having more conversations about your love life than my own love life, man. That's, that means there's a connection there, and, and it matters what you go through. And are we going to be there to go through this stuff with each other? Can I serve you in that? Especially those of the household of faith. Especially. Life is rough, y'all. Life is rough. That's why Jesus came and died. For people like me and you and even people who would never accept him as Lord and Savior. He came to die for everyone in hopes that they would repent and turn from their ways and their desires and their thoughts and turn to him and walk in the newness of life and be baptized, confess him and be baptized into the body of Christ. That's what he came for. He came to give us life and life more abundantly. He, he said, if any man decides to follow after me or desires to come after me, he must deny himself. He never said it was going to be easy. He said, but I am the prince of peace. I'll be with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And as you're carrying your cross, just know I already conquered death. Just because you're going through life. You're going through your marital issues. You're going through issues with your kids. You're going through issues within yourself. Whatever is you're going through, God will never give up on you, and you should never give up on your brother or your sister in Christ Jesus. If they just run so far that you can't get them, that's okay. That's when you say, all I can do is pray. But some of us, that's the first thing we go to is, all I can do is pray. You ain't trying to spend no time with nobody. But Jesus spent so much time with us that he became us so that he can feel the pain. We are not, we do not have a savior or a priest who does not understand everything we go through. So that means if I have to sit with somebody who I might not be comfortable with in order to get an understanding as to what they're going through so they can be restored, then I got to do it. That's servanthood. That's not the pretty stuff. It's inconvenient. It's, look, it may even feel like it's unfair. But I do believe that it was inconvenient for Jesus to have to get off his throne and come to earth and put on flesh, be spat on and beaten, lied on. I also think it's unfair that he had to die for sins that he never committed. But that's what he did, and that's who, what we should do. Beloved, we need each other. We need each other outside of this venue, this building. We need each other on Monday through Saturday when we're going through our struggles. We have to build better relationships one with another. When we go to these small groups, these build groups that we go to, we have to be honest about where we are and not have to fear somebody judging us, but know that we're in a body of believers who are going to love us even in our mess. If you love me and my stuff that I'm going through right now, it'll save me from my stuff that I might put myself in later. But we only do that by the knowing one another. I can't truly love you if I don't really know you. Let's build better relationships one with another, like real relationships like really um, being able to confide in each other. Um, everybody's not perfect. As a matter of fact, I don't think anyone is perfect. So as we share our struggles with one another and able to pray for one another and encourage one another and spur each other on to good works, know that we're doing it for we, for us. 
This building should be filled not because of the great preaching, but because we care about people and we've shown them that we love them outside of Facebook posts and outside of, you know, coming here on Sundays and saying, I'm praying for you, that we really go in and live life with them. We experience their pain with them. And we go through it with them. That's why I got saved. I got saved because I wanted that in my life. I wanted a family that, you know, all families are dysfunctional, but I wanted a family that I can, you know, not be afraid to tell everything that I'm going through and not feel like I'm letting people down. The only person that we really let down is against you and you only, O oh Lord, who I've sinned. It's him who we need to focus in on. It's him who came and died and lived and died and got up from the grave. You may stand to your feet. And if there's somebody here who, you know, you haven't been baptized into the body of Christ and, you know, man, you're like, I want this family. I want this type of relationship with people who are going to care for me um, regardless as to what I go through, that they, they're going to love me and help me get whole and help me get healed. The way that you do that, the way that you become a part of this family is by dying to yourself in baptism. And once you come up out of the watery grave of baptism, I would love to tell you that everything's going to be great. The greatest thing that happens is that the Holy Spirit now dwells and lives in you. And you get to fight with the Spirit as opposed to fight by yourself. Then there may be people here who, you know, you've been struggling in your walk. You are the person who needs to be restored. And you've been holding people and pushing people back because you think it's all about you. I'm here to tell you it's not all about you. It's about we. It's about us. Come down and get prayer. Get, work on your, your get yourself back restored. And It's not going to happen in one moment, but allow us to walk through this thing with you. You don't have to go through nothing by yourself. This relationship is not just you and Jesus. It's you and us. What you go through affects all of us. And then maybe if somebody here, you haven't, you know, you haven't forgiven anybody. You're, you're like, you're mad at people. I because it's about you and it's not about them and you need prayer and you're like I don't want that spirit I want everybody to have a full life in Jesus Christ I want everybody to have restoration I want everybody to have a peace that surpasses all understanding and I want to let go of any unforgiveness I have come down and we'll pray for him or maybe you just need prayer maybe you have some health issues maybe you have some life issues maybe you want to give a praise report Whatever it is, the front row is open for you. Lord, I turn away from my sin, Lord, and turn to you, turn to you. I thank you for saving me, Lord. Lord, have your way. Lord, have your way in me. By your spirit. Spirit, draw me near. I have the faith to see. Jesus, Jesus, you can say, say me. me. I, I believe. Is there another today? Is there another today? Oh, Jesus, you are God. God. Thank you. I thank you for saving.